As all the world knows, on last November 7th, the stars and stripes were raised over the port cities of North Africa. But it was not the first time that land had seen that flag at the head of an army. Tonight on the Cavalcade of America, we're going to tell a story 138 years old. The story of our first military exploits on those shores. The almost incredible tale of Bill Eaton, a swashbuckling Connecticut Yankee, who in 1805 sliced off and conquered Africa's richest province with only eight United States Marines and a handful of Arab mercenaries to help him. Carl Carmer suggested this astonishing and little-known story for Cavalcade, and Peter Lyon wrote the original radio play. Starring Joseph Cotton as Captain William Eaton, the hero of this African overture, the DuPont Company presents To the Shores of Tripoli on the Cavalcade of America. Our play begins with a prologue. It is a bright, sunny morning in the year 1802. In the Moorish courtyard of the piratical ruler of Tripoli, and under the personal supervision of the Bashaw himself, a delicate diplomatic ceremony is in progress. Where is the Yankee prisoner I had ordered to watch this little spectacle with me? He is here, your magnificence. Bring him forth. I prefer not to turn my head. Ah, I see the Yankee is in chains. Good. Note carefully this little ceremony, Yankee. What's it all about? My workmen chop that Yankee flagpole, and when it falls, we are at war with your Americans. The flagpole is nearly come through. Freedom has a peculiar toughness, Bashaw. It lends the state a great strength. Ah, so the flagpole is chopped down. The Yankee flag is in the dirt. Look well at it, American. Now. Tripoli is at war with the United States of America. That started it. Our play begins in the first years of the 19th century. Of the four fierce Barbary states, one is at war with the young United States of America. In one of the others, Tunis, William Eaton, played by Joseph Cotton, is American consul. And every week to William Eaton's office come American merchant captains to tell an old and bitter story of tribute levied on American shipping. You say they demanded $180 tribute from you, Captain? $180, Mr. Eaton. Only don't call it tribute. It's downright piracy. They're going up in their, uh, request. Oh, I'll say they're going up. Last time I put in at the port of Tunis, I paid out 75 good American dollars. And that was 75 too many. But 180. Must be something you can do, sir. This is plain robbery on the high seas. I want all the information you have, Captain. Let's see. Cargo of nails and rum bound for Cairo and Athens. Right. Out to Boston. This affair has held me up four days over my limit already. Can you do something? I'll do something, all right. I'll go over to the Bay's Palace right now. It's high time this piracy is stopped once and for all. <laughs> Mr. Eaton, I assume business brings you to the palace of the day. That's right, Caraman. You are in too much of a hurry, perhaps, to stop in the courtyard and speak to the new Minister of Finance, Mr. Eaton. You? Well, that's right, isn't it? Congratulations. My many happy returns of the day. Hope I'll get along better with you than I did with your predecessor. The first way, Mr. Eaton, and the only way to get along with me is to be prompt in your payment of debt to the state of Tunis. Uh -huh, the old question of tribute money, is it? Got a man? I pay when I choose. Sometimes I pay if I choose. America must be a remarkable country, Mr. Eaton. It is such a young country and still so weak. Yet her consuls speak with such a loud voice. You will kindly make the payment of tribute money for the year 1803 by sundown. Will I? One of my clerks will call at your offices, Mr. Eaton. He will be armed. And he will come straight back to your offices, Caraman, horse-whipped with this very whip. If he so much as dares set foot in my office's arms. As my mother used to teach me, one good threat deserves another. Maybe I shall call at your office myself, Mr. Eaton. 
Did your mother teach you anything to take care of a situation like that? I rather think she would have advised me not to keep my treatment waiting, Caraman. I rather think she would have said, use your horsewhip, Bill. The gentleman's waiting for it. Like that. No, and that. Taken to the bay at once. Oh. He shall be made to answer this insensitive bay in person. His Majesty, the Bay of Tunis, defender of Mohammed, prince of princes, protector of all who bow to right toward Mecca. So, Mr. Eaton. You're in hot water. You disappoint me. You insist so strenuously on the role of headstrong young man. Majesty, your minister seemed anxious for instruction on an American custom. I undertook to oblige him. This time you've gone too far, American. But I'm a generous ruler, so I offer you two courses. Either you are out of my country on the next available ship, or the alternative... Well, I, I leave to your imagination. I think you forget there is another alternative, your majesty. I'm going to allow you to sit and guess what it is until I return. You dare not return. We'll see about that after I've talked to the Secretary of State. All right, Mr. Eaton, you may come in. The Secretary of State will see you now. Thanks. Morning, Mr. Madison. Morning, Eaton. Well, sir, I must say this is a surprise. It brings you all the way from Tunis without being recalled. The fact is, sir, I uh, left the country rather hurriedly. Oh? At the urgent personal request of the Bay himself. The devil, you say? He hasn't declared war on us like the Bashaw of Triple, has he? Yeah, when I left, sir. But he may have done by now. That's why I'm in a hurry. To do what? To get back to North Africa, sir. Tripoli first, Tunis later. Tripoli? Nonsense. We've been at war with Tripoli for two years. <laughs> I know about that. I was in Africa when the Bashaw cut our flag down. Just left Cutter Manley. He's the man I'm out to get. What are you talking about, sir? Will you have the kindness to make some sense? Mr. Madison, the point about yourself, Cutter Manley, is that he's not the true Bashaw. Tripoli, his brother Ahmed, is the rightful Bashaw. Yosef threw him out of the country. Yes, yes, I know. Oh, wait, 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 sir. Listen, I'll be brief. My idea is that Ahmed would go along with us and give us the support if we offered to get him his throne back. His part of the deal would be to stop all piracy against our shipping and put an end to demands for tribute money. This is a fantastic idea. First, you'd have to find this army. Yeah, I know where he is. He's in Alexandria. From Alexandria, we strike at Durna. That's the richest of the Tripolitan provinces. No, 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 no. <laughs> just, just a minute. Are you seriously proposing to advance from Alexandria and Egypt all the way across that stretch of desert to Durna? Must be 500 miles. As a matter of fact, sir, it's 600. But it can be done, Mr. Madison, and I can do it. Eaton, you must be crazy. Do you realize how big an army and navy we need for a march like that? Half a dozen Marines and two officers. Eight men in all. Mr. Eaton, I must admit, at least that you're entertaining. I'm dead serious, sir. What do you want me to do? Sign your name to an order appointing me American naval agent in the Mediterranean. Give the cooperation of our frigates now in those waters and leave the rest to me. Well, Mr. Eaton, if you're willing to take the consequences, I'll get you your order. Well, Captain Eaton, you'll forgive me, but I think this is a reckless, unfortunate, and hopeless venture. From start to finish. Here's a coffee shop. Come on, now. Cheer up. You're not dead yet. Who are you? What do you want? Come to see Ahmed Pasha. I wrote a letter. I'm Eaton. William Eaton? The American? That's right. This is Lieutenant O'Baron of the United States Marines. You follow me. Alone. Lead on. Now, wait a minute. I'm going to stick right with you. Alone. You come alone. You. You stay here. I do nothing of a sort. I've got... Hey, hey! Yes, he means business, okay? Tell him to get that scimitar away from here. I shoot his head take off. Take it easy. Take it easy. Okay? You, Eden. You come along. And you... You wait here. All right. Stop here. Come in. 
mean. Good. There now. Where's Amit? Which of you is Amit? I am Amit, gentlemen. You? Amit? Good. Now, can I talk in front of these people here? Talk. They are friends. Very well. Now listen, I'm in a hurry. I'm going to make you bash your Tripoli again. You'll be able to do what you like with your brother. You make me bash our game. How much? <laughs> this won't cost you a penny. Just your word that no tribute will be levied by Tripoli on American commerce. Just my word. And there'll be some of our people around to make sure you don't forget you gave your word. Yes, of course. But how do you propose... Raise an army, march on Denver and seize it. Dictate terms from there. Go on to take Tripoli itself if necessary. An army to Denver. 600 miles, gentlemen. Where would I get the man? Oh, that's my job. How many followers have you here in Alexandria? Oh, not 100 men. 90. 90? Good. I'll raise the rest. You'll take care of getting camels and camel drivers. We need about 75, I figure. But such a march has never been done before, gentlemen. You worry about that. You just get the camels and drivers. Can you do it? Well, for a price, it is possible. Then have them at the Arabs Tower. You know the place? In the desert to the west, yes. Have them there on Wednesday night, ready to start. of camels on that got together, O'Baron. Oh, believe me, Captain Eaton, we should call the whole business off right here now. Ah, what's the matter, Lieutenant? I'd say we were all ready. Huh? There's you, Sergeant Peck. Yeah, look at him, will you, trying to drill some discipline into that crowd. And we have six of our own Marines. And that's all. And that's really all. Oh, I don't know. Ahmed and his crew don't add up to much, but he did deliver the camel drivers. And there's my Greeks. I'm really proud of them. Thirty four of them. <laughs> Listen, O'Malley, don't worry so much. And just what do we do when we get out in the desert and our supplies have run out? Now, don't forget, we're meeting Captain Hull's ship at Bomba, the halfway point. He'll have fresh supplies. And if we don't get to Bomba, if we get out in the desert and these Arabs decide to mutiny, look at this arm at close, Captain. You can't trust him. He's right behind you. Oh, ah, gentlemen, sir, we leave right away, gentlemen. Listen, stop calling me that. Call me Captain Eaton. Yes, we're ready. The camel drivers are. Yes. They want to stay, gentlemen, a uh, captain. Tell them they'll be paid at the first stop. Yeah, but the captain, they insist. Pay at the first stop. Let's go. <laughs> Less than three weeks, and we're 200 miles along. Well, I wish I could share your cheerfulness, sir. Why not? Another 100 miles, and we've reached Bomba. The August meets us there with fresh supplies. Why not be cheerful? Oh, Captain Eaton, sir. What is it, Sergeant? It's camel drivers. They're uh, packing up to go back, huh? They claim Armit only hired them to go this far. They say they've gone as far as they're going to go. I might have known that, Armit. Where's the lead of the camel drivers? I am here. Oh. Alan, what's all this about? All right, Pasha pay us to go this far, no farther. You can't turn back now. We're only a third of the way to Derna. All right, Pasha pay us to go this far, no farther. No, thank you. Can't you stay with us just a few more days? All right, Pasha pay us to go this far, no farther. I'm beginning to believe you. Oh, Baron, how much money can we raise? We have a little over $600 with us still, sir. All right, Pasha pay us. All right, all right, all right. I'll pay you more. $450 to take us to the next added encampment so we can hire new drivers. Tom and Pasha pay us to go. That's the only English you know. Five hundred dollars. Six hundred dollars. Six hundred and fifty. That's all we've got. Six hundred and fifty dollars for four more days. To the next oasis. Captain Eaton, that leaves exactly six dollars and fifty-four cents in the treasury. Well, how about it? Tom and Pasha pay us. Oh. oh, here's a bargain. Thank heaven he knew that word. <laughs> listening to The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, starring Joseph Cotton in To the Shores of Tripoli, a fantastic story of the Marines in Africa 138 years ago. As our play continues, 
Captain William Eaton, played by Joseph Cotton, has led his little army of eight Marines and a few score Arabs 300 miles across the desert to Bamba, halfway point of their march to Berna. Here at Bamba, they are to meet the American frigate Argus with fresh supplies. But no ship rides at anchor in the harbor. Well, I hate to say I told you so, sir. Two days. We're two days behind schedule. Why didn't Hull wait for us? Couldn't he wait two days? Captain Eaton, gentlemen, the ship, the American ship that brings supplies to us army, where is she? Oh, probably around the cove to the left on it. Take it easy. Captain Eaton, my men, they are starved. They are not eating in three days. Not good eating in three weeks. I haven't been exactly stuffing myself with food. My eh? men, Captain Eaton, I cannot take responsible for them. Say, hey, Eaton, look at them. They're, they're coming for them. Amit, this is mutiny. Order your men back. I go to my men, Captain Eaton, but I give them no order. Amit, you're still under my order. We will see who is in command, Captain. First, my men want their revenge on you. You will excuse me, Captain. Oh, down. Oh, the Greeks have joined the Marines behind me at once. Right, Sergeant Peck. Yes, sir. Get our loyal men into our hollow square. Quick. Hey. Yes, sir. Hey! Hold him! Hold him! Hey! 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 He's in, he's in, look. He's calling his men off. Well, what's the matter with him? Only a car. The chop scared him to death. That means, that means, look for It's a sail. It's a sail, I tell you. It's the object. Rounding the point. Thank heaven. And not a minute too soon. <laughs> Captain Eaton? Captain Hull. I'm certainly glad to see you, sir. This is our second trip to Bombay, Eaton. We must give you up for long. Well, if you hadn't come when you did, sir, we would have been. Well, how many ships have we within fighting distance? Huh? The Argus across. Huh? And the Hornet. Nautilus are two days sail away. I figure it'll take us three weeks more marching to reach Dana. That would be the uh, 25th of April. Can you get the Hornet and the Nautilus to join you and sail into Dana Harbor on the 27th? You come in from the sea... And we'll storm them from the land. You seem uh, mighty sure you can bring us off, Ethan. Now, uh, I know about your Marines, but how are the rest of your soldiers? Well, not very good, Captain Hallman. I haven't given up hoping yet. Well, Lieutenant O'Baron, are we all here? We are, sir, yes, sir. Myself, you, Sergeant Peck, and the six Marines. You can fight like more than six, sir. I'm sure of that. Now then, all of you, listen to me. We're not in very good shape, any of us. Nine or ten weeks on the desert. Food, nothing to boast about. I called you together because I wanted to impress on you how... Well, what a tough job we've got ahead of us. There's dinner. You just see those walls. This is the evening of the 26th. Tomorrow, our frigates will sail into that harbor to bombard the town. We'll attack by land. You six, so Baron, Peck, and I. The Greeks will fight with us, I'm pretty sure. For the rest, we'll... Any questions? Yes, sir. What Newton, sir? How many men inside the city? Have we any way known? Maybe 6,000. And fighting trim. Why? Just one of them, sir. About 300 apiece for us and the Greeks. That's right. Well, there's a fight now. Sit down here in the tent of Baron. Yes, sir. Sent for Ahmed, holding the council of war. Fine. Well, then at least he's prompt. Here he comes now. Come in, Ahmed. And then all set for their scrap tomorrow morning? No, 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 no. We will not fight this walled city, my men and I. What's the trouble, Ahmed Pasha? Food, disagree with you? Inside the walls, there are many, much bullets. Not good. We are too few. Hmm. What do you think, Lieutenant O'Baron? Ahmed Pasha, 
Why did you and your men come all the way to Gunner if you don't want to fight now that we're here? There are too many in the walls of the city. Twenty, twenty-five to one. They are more than we. Tomorrow we're going to fight if the governor inside insists on it. And you'll fight too, Ahmed Pasha. And your men will fight with you. My men do as I tell them, Captain. I say we won't fight. I know you're a coward, Ahmed. I suspect that you're a traitor as well. A good mind to have you shot as an example to your men. Captain, yes, Sergeant. What is it? Governor's answer to our offer said, Ahmed, I told the governor you would grant him full pardon if he surrendered. Apparently, he's not the coward you are. Here's his answer. It's addressed to you. Read it. Addressed to me. And it says, My head or yours. Looks like you've got a tough choice to make, son. If you don't fight, I shoot you. If you do fight and lose, the governor takes your head to send to your brother as a souvenir. Maybe they'll use your skull for an ink well. The sort of thing your brother'd like to do. The plight says uh, only one thing for you to do, Ahmed. Well, uh, looks like you'll fight come tomorrow morning and all your men with you. And it looks like you'd better get them to fight well enough to win. Excuse me, please. I feel sick. I go to my men. Nice work. But it's lucky the governor wrote that note back. That note? Yes. The governor? Yes. I wrote that note myself. <laughs> should be coming in now. Have a look through your glasses, sir. Yes. Now it's that. There they come, all three of them. The artist, Norton, is hard. Good for Captain Hull. Sergeant, they have opened fire. Have the Egyptians bring the field piece up to there as close as they can. Tell them to try and breach the wall somewhere. Keep aiming at one spot. Right, sir. Where are my Marines? All right, O'Brien. Let's go. All right, sir. Everybody, to the attack. Do you take your shots to be close to the wall? Come on. Let the double. Reporting, sir. Four dead and counting yourself for ten wounded. The city is ours. The garrison fled to the west for an hour. I have cavalry cut them off. Good. How's your arm, sir? It's all right. Only a flesh wound. Uh, uh, Who's this? Excellency, Captain Mercy, disarm it. Quiet, quiet. Well, Don, who's this? The governor of Gurner, Captain. Ahmed seems to think uh, that... Yes, Captain Eaton, you remember our little bargain, the governor and I, the little matter of head. But, Captain, honor of excellency, I know nothing of this. Oh, head. oh, yes. Now, uh, look, Ahmed, uh, now that you are the ruler of this country again, you should remember that uh, your majesty's greatest gift is mercy. Oh, but, Captain, gentlemen, the bargain is a bargain here. No, head. no, 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 Ahmed. I have a message I want this governor to take to your brother, Yosef. Governor, I want you to go to Tripoli. Tell Yosef that the stars and stripes wave above your palace here in Derna. And tell him that I am coming to Tripoli personally to raise the American flag that he cut down. Tell him it's going to wave over his very capital. <laughs> Joseph Cotton. Ladies and gentlemen, later in the broadcast, Mr. Cotton will appear again. Before he does, we have a story to tell of the part chemistry is playing in the drive for salvage. This year, the 82 plants of the DuPont Company will salvage more than 60,000 tons of scrap metal. Salvage is nothing new to the chemical industry, for salvage is merely another word for conservation. And industrial chemistry is built around the idea of conservation, finding more economical ways to produce and use materials. Coal tar was once thrown away, for instance, because we did not realize its usefulness. Today, thanks to chemical science, drugs, dyes, disinfectants, hundreds of things are made from coal tar. DuPont set up a salvage and reclamation division 35 years ago, a central control for handling waste materials. In 1907, its first year, the division salvaged, among other things, some acid drums, an old ladder, and three dollars worth of wood ashes. This year, the salvage of scrap metal alone by this division will amount to 60,000 tons. Hundreds of men in DuPont plants will devote all of their time to salvaging materials 
ranging from conduit and valves to boilers and electric motors representing thousands of units of vital power. This type of salvage finds its way back to the steel mills. Even the sand banks into which test shells are fired are screened to recover lead and copper. Cleaning rags, waste paper, broken glass, burlap bags, cotton fuzz, cloth, containers, and bristles are reclaimed. Rolled steel drums are salvaged by the thousands, the dents ironed out and the holes welded. Even typewriter spools are returned to the manufacturer by the thousands. Every DuPont plant organization makes a continuous survey of buildings and equipment. Lists of any machines that become idle are circulated to all departments. Valuable machines and materials idle in one location are sent where they are needed. Equipment listed and not called for is sold to other companies for use in war work. But the ordinary kind of salvage in plants everywhere, important as it is, is small beside the hundreds and thousands of tons of material that industry is able to conserve in other ways with the help of chemistry. For instance, for many industries, chemical science saves metallic leftovers and puts them back to work. Leftovers like iron sludge, which helps to feed the blast furnaces producing America's steel. Another example of industrial salvage is the use of a DuPont solvent in removing oil from woolen cloth. One manufacturer alone reports that 250 drums of this solvent salvaged 650 drums of spinning oil and in addition made it unnecessary for him to use 20,000 gallons of naphtha, 250 drums of ammonia, 56,000 pounds of sulfonated castor oil, 150,000 pounds of soda ash, and 75,000 pounds of soap. Literally tons of materials were released to other manufacturers who needed them for other kinds of war work. This is salvage. Salvage and conservation are one and the same thing. One more activity touched by the helping hand of the chemist who brings you better things for better living through chemistry. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the star of tonight's Cavalcade of America, Joseph Cotton. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pleasure reenacting on Cavalcade tonight this almost forgotten incident in our history. For by such adventurous exploits, we are reminded, especially in the coincidence of this story, of the power of the past in shaping the forces of the present. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, will present a new radio play based on a favorite American classic, The Perfect Tribute. This celebrated and touching story is about the great emancipator in a moment of mingled triumph and despair. And our star will be Edwin Jerome. us next week when Cavalcade presents Edwin Jerome as Abraham Lincoln in a new radio play based on a famous short story, The Perfect Tribute. Joseph Cotton, whose latest motion picture, Shadow of a Doubt, is being shown throughout the country, appeared on tonight's program through the courtesy of David O. Selznick. The orchestra and musical score tonight were under the direction of Don Vorey. This is Clayton Collier sending best wishes from Cavalcade sponsor, the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. Come to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company.